Um, so uh, we'd love to see your name and uh, town that you're in. Um, we've got some presentations um, that I'm going to introduce you to in just a minute. Um, for the beginning, we're going to be taking questions from the chat. So if you haven't found it, look for the uh, chat function in your Zoom bar. And um, if you have a question for the first two speakers, um, enter it in the chat and we will re relay that to them at the end of their conversation, at, of their presentation. Um, for our input discussion part of the meeting, that is going to be no screen being shared. We're just going to be looking at each other and you'll be using the raise your hand feature of Zoom um, to be called on. So uh, get yourself familiar with those and with that we'll get started. So my guess is everyone on this uh, in this meeting knows where Boyce Hill is, but I've got a, a map here for us. So this on the left, you'll see a picture of uh, the town of Faston with our two town forests on it. And Boyce Hill is at the end of Boyce Road in North Faston. So if you can see my mouse, that's, uh, that's, that's this very special little green place right there. Um, and this is a closer in map of the property. Um, this is Boyce Road. And as many of us probably are well familiar. It's, it's a uh, open space. So it's been mowed and uh, that's one of its um, special features and one of its opportunities for really important decision-making about how we move forward. Uh, Boyce Hill, uh, here's some, some shots from it. Uh, it's special for a number of reasons. It was a hill farm and evidence of um, those inhabitants in the 1800s is still there and reminds us of uh, an important heritage. Um, it's a great place for berries. It's a great place for skiing. It's a great place to feel small in a 180 degree view of uh, this amazing valley that, uh, that we share. And our goal is to develop a management plan that, that is really um, as based in, in a vision for this place that, um, that we can really come up with an optimal plan for it. And a big part of that is hearing from other people who care as deeply about it as we do. So today um, we're gonna do some learning and we're gonna do some listening. Um, the learning piece, uh, we'll share a little bit with you about the, the Boyce Hill um, management planning process that we're in the midst of. Um, <clears throat> we will go over the conservation easement and the, the great work that's being done uh, by the Vermont Land Trust um, to protect Boyce Hill and, and many properties like it. Um, and then, uh, Ethan Tapper is going to um, share with us about town forest management planning. He knows a thing or two about it. <laughs> he's, he's worked with many um, towns to do the very work that we're attempting to do here. Uh, and then, so for, for this part of the conversation um, and presentation, questions appear in the chat. So, and at the end, briefly, um, of Liza's presentation, we will um, direct some questions to her if there are any and say, same with Ethan. And then we're here to listen to each other and uh, as the steering committee um, putting this plan together for Boyce Hill, we're here to listen to you. And we're really excited that uh, Peter Forbes of Knoll Farm is gonna be able to help us facilitate that conversation where you're sharing your input uh, what you love about Boyce Hill, um, where you think it ought to go. So as I said, we're scheduled to wrap at 8.30. Um, happy to extend it um, longer till nine if, um, if the conversation asks for that. So this is, um, this is our job description as a steering committee. 
start out by just learning about the property as much as we can. Um, and it's been a lot of work getting to this point. Uh, first of all, the Vermont Land Trust conservation easement on the property was um, a part of our learning process. Um, the interim management plan, as soon as the, the, the property was gifted to the town, um, uh, we formed an interim management plan. This was asked for uh, in the conservation easement. And that was uh, that work was done by um, Corey Miller and uh, Lisa, who you'll hear from in just uh, a little bit. Um, we did a bird assessment and a natural resources inventory and an ecological assessment of the property. So these are these are the baseline um, data that we collected. This is where we are in the process now. So we're now here to, to hear from the community and other people who care about it. We've gotten a lot of informal input already while we've been on the property talking to others who are enjoying it. Um, we have, this is the first of four um, forums to create a vision for the property. Um, this one is on management planning. We'll give you more information about the others if you're not aware already uh, at the end. Uh, the next one is going to be on the natural resources. Um, the one following that will be on recreation value of the property. And a fourth one is kind of um, uh, to be determined. Uh, we'll, but uh, this, is, this is the listening part and we're, we're approaching it open-mindedly, eagerly, appreciatively of, of anyone who's, who's got a, a thought to share. And then we take what we've learned um, and uh, we do a values check. You know, we're, we're going to evaluate how this fits certainly with the conservation easement, but um, the things that, uh, that we're gonna share with you, we've defined as, as the values that um, will inform the management uh, planning process. Um, it's, a, it's a mission statement that I'm going to read to you. There's a much more detailed vision statement on the Conservation um, Commission's page that I encourage you to read. Uh, and then if we've done all that well, we will make everyone happy. Nah. <laughs> we're, we're quite confident that um, there's going to be some give and take in the process. And, and I'll be honest with you, as we, the steering committee, have gone through this process ourselves, um, we've experienced what uh, I'm confident the whole community is, is going to experience. We're just, we've just gone through it uh, internally with ourselves. And there are some tensions, right? You can't do, be all things to all people on this property. And so really what's going to happen next is a process of optimizing and balancing the sometimes conflicting and sometimes bumping up against uh, each other priorities that uh, that we hear um, uh, from the, from this community. Uh, after we've done that, we are going to draft a management plan. Um, it's going to uh, speak to how we should manage the property over the next five ten years, but it's it's going to be a living document and a and a process that. We'll will repeat on an ongoing basis. We'll be doing that um, with uh, input from the Vermont Land Trust in, in that they are the, the um, uh, stewards, if you will, of, of the easement that is, is guiding this process. So, and we're very appreciative for their participation. And um, uh, as, a, as a result of that, we're gonna have a management plan and maybe as a result of that process, we're gonna go back and listen some more. I don't know, but um, the idea is to get it right and to hear everything that is to be said um, and to overlay that with the values and what the land has um, is telling us as well uh, to come up with a final plan. That final plan will be presented to the select board, who is the ultimate uh, arbiter of, of, of this process and uh, will approve it um, and, and the, the funding really of the activities to implement the, the management plan. And then when we're happily retired, enjoying the beautiful Boyce Hill um, 
town forest that begins to emerge as a result of our work, we'll probably start the process over again. Um, but, but that's how we see our job. Uh, the timing of it is that we have been asked to deliver the management plan by the end of the year. So we'll be doing the listening over the summer, um, putting the plan together itself in the fall, uh, presenting it uh, for select board approval end of the fall. This is the steering committee um, and maybe you guys can raise your hands um, just so people can, can see who you are. Uh, Lisa Koich and, and Corey Miller are on the Conservation Commission um, and they did all the massive heavy lifting early on, just the two of them uh, to come up with the interim management plan, did a fabulous job. And um, for whatever reason, they felt committed enough to stay with the plan. <laughs> and um, uh, they uh, did the work of selecting the steering committee, which is uh, comprised of me. Woody Dugan uh, lives right at the bottom of uh, um, Boyce Road. Uh, Sally Dwyer lives, uh, she's not quite in a butter, but pretty close uh, off of Dunbar Hill. Uh, Chuck Martell is uh, representing the select board um, in this process and has been an active uh, participant. Uh, Carrie Thomas um, comes to us with, with experience from the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, um, has done uh, uh, amazing uh, work getting public input into that fabulous resource. Uh, and then we have been getting ongoing support uh, from Caitlin Cusack and, and Lisa Walker from the Vermont Land Trust. So it's really been a, a pleasure uh, working with this group. And as I said, we've been going through the process of, of learning and um, understanding our intentions and biases and um, uh, coming up with a process that we think is going to result in a, in a, a terrific plan. This is our mission statement. I'm just going to read it. You can read it with me. The Boyce Hill Town Forest Steering Committee will develop a long-term management plan for Boyce Hill Town Forest that creates a balance between the conservation of natural resources, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and diverse recreational uses, and that fosters educational opportunities, thus respecting the health of the land and enhancing our community. So that's kind of top level um, how we're feeling about what our job is um, and we'll, sh we'll shape the process that we're going to undertake. Um, so let me just wrap this up by saying that, that every road in the valley was likely once an Abenaki footpath. There have been generations of people who have passed through here before us and there will be many more after. And it's a history that we may know a little bit about, but it's largely unknown. And we are planning, um, we're putting together our thoughts for developing a plan that will respect that legacy. Um, and with the humility that comes from not really knowing, but really doing our best to sense um, what the community needs and what the land is telling us uh, that it needs. And it's kind of that same humility and respect that I hope we all bring to this presentation. Uh, each of us has a different perspective, different uh, knowledge base uh, about the property and about things that could probably influence um, how, how we determine what's best for the property. So we're really looking forward to a respectful, uh, open-minded dialogue. And this is just the first of four of these. So um, there, there's plenty more uh, conversation to come. I will say that I, I, I did really forget to mention there's a survey um, that is gonna be launched shortly um, where you will be able to offer your formal input. Um, and uh, this, is, this is part of that input process. So just some quickie Zoom etiquette. Um, we'd like to see your name. We'd like to see your face. We'd love to see your cats. If you're having a glass of wine or, or water, tea, um, that's fine. Um, and 
sorry. And um, um, for these next um, presentations, we'd just like you to put your, your, your questions in the chat. So with that, I am going to introduce Liza and I've got a bio here for you that I wanna read because I couldn't do it justice um, from memory. So Liza is the Mad River Valley Regional Director for the Vermont Land Trust. For the last 15 years, she's worked with private landowners, municipalities, and other local partners in the area to permanently protect working farms, woodlands, recreation trails, and public lands that contribute to the health and vitality of, the, of this watershed community. Liza's lived in Waitsfield for the last 22 years and is grateful to be raising two kids in this great place. So with that, Liza, if you could unmute yourself. We would love to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Pete, and really nice to, um, to be here with you all. I'd rather be standing in a room, but <laughs> together, but soon enough. Uh, but it's really nice to, to have your company, even over the, over the Zoom meeting, and that so many of you are here, I think speaks to the, uh, the real power of, of Voice Hill and the value to so many of us. Um, Pete, thanks for that really thoughtful introduction to this process. I think it gives a sense uh, already of just uh, yeah, how thoughtful this um, amazing steering committee is in undertaking this management planning process. Um, so yeah, it's an honor to, to be the sort of opening act here, a little bit of pressure to warm up the crowd for, for rock stars, Ethan and, and Peter and all of you, but I'll try. I thought I'd just quickly just mention um, the overview of the Vermont Land Trust, who's ever not familiar with the organization that we are, a private uh, nonprofit organization um, based in Montpelier, but we have 43 staff members working around the state, really embedded in communities, doing conservation work. And I've been really lucky enough to, to live where I work for the last 15 years, um, doing all kinds of projects. So yeah, we've got about, uh, I think we've gone over 600,000 acres conserved now. It's about 10% of the Vermont landscape permanently protected with conservation easements. And I just wanted to say, we talk a lot about conserving land and you know, conservation has a lot of meanings and what we, we have a specific meaning when we talk about conserving land and that's the use of a, a legal tool called a conservation easement. Um, and that's a, a document which um, basically restricts the uses of, of land to, um, to really focus on its certain intended uses, which is to use the land for agriculture or forestry purposes or education and recreation. Uh, land-based economic uses. Um, and the main thing that really restricts is the subdivision of land, commercial and recreation development, um, and use of the resources that uh, would not make them um, sustainable for other activities. So um, these easements intend to keep land intact as, as parcels. Um, and uh, they also, they attach to a title of property and they're recorded in the in the vault, in the town documents um, with deeds and they run with the land. So when a conservation easement is placed on a property by a landowner or by a town, it will forever run, run with the land um, to permanently protect that. Um, so Pete, you can switch us over. Uh, a lot of our work is known for doing farmland conservation for sure. Um, uh, and, you know, wood lots and all kinds of small privately owned parcels, but community projects are a huge part of our work. Um, about, you know, over, over 70 pro projects in the state really have been about establishing town forests, um, protecting swimming holes, uh, town greens. We even have a sledding hill up in Jericho that's protected. So places where, where people really come together um, to, you know, to enjoy the outdoors and recreate and see people and, and, and bird and all kinds of things like that. And here in the Valley, we have a number of um, town forests where we're really super lucky. And a bunch of these have been done with the Vermont Land Trust. Uh, at the top there, we've got the Scrag Mountain Forest that was um, been done over a period of time. And then Woo Ledges is the middle picture. And then the bottom, you might recognize some of those faces. That's the, the Chase Brook Town Forest in Faison, 
which is also conserved. Um, and uh, that was exploring that land um, with the Conservation Commission a couple of years ago. So, um, so the Vermont Land Trust has been really pleased to be a part of uh, Four Town Forests and, and Boyce Hill, uh, if you want to switch key, is the, is the latest uh, community project. And again, we're calling it a town forest, but it's of course many, many other things too. And I just wanted to share a little bit about our, our connection to this land and, and why it connects us to this management planning process. Um, so basically, um, similar to Woo Ledges and to Scrag Mountain Town Forest, this, this town ownership was made possible through a generous gift of land um, in 2019. So a couple of years ago, uh, Vermont Land Trust received a call from the landowner at the time. Um, and she's, she, uh, you know, at the time she bought it, I think it was in 2011, um, you know, the property was subject to an eight lot subdivision. There was a road um, put to the top um, by a prior landowner. And so the, the future of the land was uncertain. Um, uh, we didn't really know which way it would go. And over the years, we had heard from people who really valued this property and hoped to see it conserved. So it was, you know, one of those amazing serendipitous things to get a call from somebody. And she was saying, you know, um, that she really recognized the tremendous um, beauty of this property, the power it had to inspire awe and give you a sense of peace and in the world. Um, and also recognized, you know, the tremendous connections that many people in the community had to the land. So she wondered, would it be possible to find a way to permanently protect this land and make it available for public enjoyment? And um, we were so thrilled to, to be able to explore that with her and to bring this opportunity to the town's attention. And after a period of conversations and some um, public discourse about it, um, the decision was made to accept this gift of land and the landowner donated the land to the town. And then about a month later, the town elected to um, place a permanent conservation easement on the land with the Vermont Land Trust so that we could be partners in, in the long-term stewardship and protection of the land. Thanks, Pete, you wanna switch it? Um, so like I said, we've, we've done a number of these projects in different kinds of places. Conservation easements are on public land are a little different from the easements we have on working farms and other forests. Um, you know, by nature of being these special public places, it's, it's where people come together and gather and have fun and connect with the natural world. Um, and so the easements are, are a little bit different um, uh, in how they're structured. Um, if you want to switch to the next slide, Pete. Um, easements in general share many common characteristics. Um, they're organized around a, a set of purposes. Um, protecting the natural resources that are that are there. Um, these, some of these pictures are from Boyce Hill, you recognize there's some, um, there's some wood frog eggs and I think in the middle there in the wildlife habitats and small vernal pools and, and the, the trails um, that people have followed to the top of the hill. There's a few hidden streams and there's a little bit of woodland too uh, around the edges. So there's these um, special aspects of the property with which the conservation easement is, is designed to protect. Um, and, and really balanced. So the real difference with these easements on these public lands um, is that, uh, you know, there's lots and lots and hundreds and, and thousands of people who, who uh, are involved in really in the ownership. And so um, the conservation easements really require uh, that there be a, a management plan um, that's, that's created with a lot of public input to look at how to balance all of these different uses and make sure that um, the decisions are made thoughtfully uh, and to maximize the benefits to, to all of those conservation purposes. Switch over. Um, can never remember which slide is gonna come next. So I'm almost <laughs> there. So the easements do, you know, there's, it's specific in, in, in many ways, there's many sort of bottom lines, so to speak, in terms of restrictions you know, subdivision is, is restricted, um, in industrial or, or residential use or many commercial uses are, are restricted. Um, things that might hurt or damage the soils, uh, mining or excavation, the sale of topsoil or uh, gravel. Um, motorized recreation is, is, a, is a main uh, stipulation that's uh, made in the easement. 
um, protecting the streams so that they can flow uh, naturally and um, the aquatic habitat can be protected. That's an important um, bottom line of the, of the easement. Um, and then on the other side, there's many things which are permitted, not necessarily required. For instance, you don't have to manage the forest if you don't want to, you know, if you don't choose to extract any any timber or, or forest products, you can you, you can leave leave the trees um, without a um, specific um, plan per per the easement. Um, maple sugaring again, so none of these things are, are mandated, but they're permitted by the easement um, as long as they're sort of described in the management plan uh, how you will do it. So if you do want to do any sugaring or um, harvest timber, and you know whenever that's uh, possible, then then you really need to have a forest management plan and, and Ethan can talk more to that aspect of it. So, so there's this balance in the easement of things that are restricted and things that are permitted um, often with some sort of conditions or, um, or evaluation involved in that. Um, and again, it's really uh, comes down to the work that you're about to undertake um, in the management plan. Okay, one last slide, I think Pete. Um, the work that you'll do in the management plan to consider what what their priorities are um, and address how public access will happen. I will add that that, that is one requirement um, in a in a conservation easement on public land is that the public must be allowed to enjoy the property, uh, and that's um, that's a really one of the most vital aspects of it uh, for pedestrian uses. Um, like walking and skiing and, and birding and things like that. Um, and then there's other uses which need to be sort of looked at more, more carefully to see what works, whether it's mountain bikes or, um, you know, um, snowmobiles at the, at the discretion of the town or other things. So, um, but public access is, is a bottom line. And then the management plan has um, these various things that can be addressed. That uh, that sometimes can become um, challenging on a public property, such as as dogs or different kinds of trails, and how many trails you want to have, and all that. Um, and then the transfer of the property is another thing that the conservation easement speaks to. If the town were ever to say we don't want this property anymore, of course the conservation easement stays on it, um, and uh, the town, you know, the Vermont Land Trust would be involved in, in who the next owner of the property would be to ensure that all of these. Um, public use goals and um, other resource protection goals remained intact. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of uh, one, oh yeah, so you did mention that the interim management plan was, was set up as a, as a placeholder um, and that was required by the, by the conservation easement uh, at the, right at the start. Um, but other than that, um, yeah, I'm open to any questions. Really, uh, so excited to be participating with all of you in this in this process and with the steering committee. Thank you. Thanks, Liza. VLT and and you in particular <laughs> been uh, have been awesome and and um, appreciate it. Carrie Thomas is going to check the chat and and um, direct any questions that uh, have appeared to to Liza. As the manager of the chat, we don't have any questions yet. If anyone does have questions for Liza, I think we'll move on to Ethan now, but please throw them in there and we can ask them at the end of Ethan's presentation so we can move on. Okay, well, uh, we're gonna switch here and Ethan's gonna share his screen. Let me, before we do that, let me just tell you that uh, Ethan is the Chittenden County Forester for Vermont uh, Department of Parks, Forests and Recreation. Um, he works with landowners, foresters, loggers, conservation organizations and mun municipalities to spread the word of how to take care of our forests and to manage them responsibly for a wide range of benefits. In Chittenden County, Ethan works with communities to manage a dozen town forests. He's done this before, <laughs> totaling more than 4,000 acres for wildlife, water, wood, recreation, conservation, education, and the demonstration of responsible forest management. So I'm going to stop sharing here, and, and uh, Ethan, you take it from here. Sounds good. So... Again, my name is Ethan Tapper. I'm, I'm the Chittenden County Forester and I'm, I'm covering for our new Washington County Forester. His name is Robert Nelson and he will be just starting full time on the job really soon. 
And so he was just getting started. So I figured I'd, I'd step in and see if I could add something to this discussion. Um, and I'm going to share my screen and present a highly abridged uh, presentation. I'm going to try and do this in like an hour presentation in like 17 minutes. So here we go. So it's about land use and management planning here at the Faced in Town Forest. Um, and again, if you have questions about this as I go through it, go through it. I'm going to go through it pretty fast. So just just put them in the chat, and also know that there will be a recording of this that's available after the fact. So you'll be able to check it out again if something gets by you. So what's land use? So land use is a really vague. Uh, term and it's one of those terms where you think about it, you think about it, you think about it, and it sort of like loses all meaning. Um, but what it is essentially is how we manage and how we use our ecosystems, our natural systems for our own benefit. Um, examples of this are forest management, agriculture, education, hunting, recreation. We have to use our landscape in some way. It's unavoidable. Um, but the question is, how do we want to do that? And specifically to narrow it further in this case is, how do we wanna manage all of these different uses on a piece of public land that belongs to all of us? And so I wanna give you a little bit of context for town forests um, for what we're looking at. Uh, our enabling legislation that allowed towns, municipalities to acquire uh, what we now call town forests, also called municipal forests, properties for the, the purpose of forest management was uh, just over a hundred years ago in 1915. That statute describes municipal forests as being, quote, attractive land primarily devoted to producing wood products, maintaining wildlife habitat, protecting water supplies, providing forest recreation and conservation education. Uh, and so for a quote from such a long time ago, it's actually a really good descriptor of what town forests are and, and the range of benefits that they offer us. Um, those early town forests were really different than the town forests that we have today though, in many ways, uh, the state, uh, in the early days of town forests, paid for some of those reforestation and acquisition costs of uh, acquiring and, as was in vogue at the time, replanting some of those town forests, which many of which were depleted and abandoned farms. And those early town forests were mostly managed for timber and water. Um, there were some really interesting uh, laws that were put in place to encourage towns to acquire and manage their town forests. One of them that is that I really, really like is in 1951, uh, Vermont passed this law that required each town without a town forest to put a question of whether they should get a town forest in the warning for their town meeting. So if you didn't have one, you had to talk about it. Today, um, so those those old, in Chittenden County, those, those old school town forests that were acquired like in the er really early 1900s, a lot of them are water management forests, they're centered around what reservoirs, or they're other otherwise comprised of like, you know, tax derelict and abandoned old farm parcels. Today, the what makes up our town forest is really different. So um, we have community forests, uh, municipal forests, town forests, natural areas, conservation areas, lots of different names for what is essentially the same thing. So it's a piece of forested land that's owned by a municipality. Many of these newer town forests, whatever you call them, they have conservation easements and they're acquired as part of a conservation partnership. So um, a town will team up with an organization like the Vermont Land Trust or the Trust for Public Land and gather together the funding and, and um, the, the public will to, to acquire a piece of land. And at the end of that process, not only is that piece of land owned by the town, but it's also conserved and protected with a conservation easement like Liza was talking about. And they're all different kinds of places, and they're managed for all different kinds of stuff. So every time, whoop, every time I talk about town forests, I have to put this slide in it. Town forests are cool. So congratulations, guys. You got a cool thing. Um, they are as varied as the communities that govern them. Uh, they are managed in all different kinds of ways for all different uses. And the way that they're managed, they're these really open, transparent, inclusive public lands, right? So that you can have an input on in your community in a way that you can't have as direct an input if you're commenting on like the management of state lands or the management of federal lands. Like you can just go show up to a Zoom meeting or hopefully soon again, a public meeting at the town office once a month and 
uh, provide input, make a big deal about something, and chances are you can steer the course of the management of that town forest. Um, and that's really, really powerful. And the people who are governing and managing these lands are just people just like us. Um, you know, there, there are community members who are volunteering their time and they're just, it, what that yields is these pieces of lands that are really reflective of the communities that own them um, and that are all just so unique. So what's a management plan on a town forest and why do we need one? Liza touched on this a little bit as well. Um, so what the, we talked about what land use is. So it's all this different stuff that we can do on the land. Um, what management plans do is they refine how we're using the land. So they're saying they're guiding these, these, these types of land use like forestry, like recreation, like hunting, other activities that we might do on public land. Uh, and refining that beyond the terms of the conservation easement. So the conservation easement has some rules that Liza discussed, but then we can also really refine in on those, like exactly how do we wanna do all of these wide range of things that are still allowed in that conservation easement. The other thing that it can do is to mitigate potential conflicts between uses, um, like you know inevitable conflicts between town forests that are managed actively for forest management, um, like the Hinesburg Town Forest, which I spent a lot of time doing these demonstration forest management projects on, and which also has this really active recreational community and the, the inherent conflicts in that. So how do we dictate that? Or as is, as is often the case, that the conflict between hunting and recreation, um, wanting people to feel like they can hunt on the land, if that's something that's allowed, and wanting recreationalists to also feel like they can feel safe on their public lands and use those public lands. So. Um, the management plan, the goal of these management plans on these public lands is to mitigate these conflicts and or to describe how these addresses will be challenged, how these challenges will be addressed when they come up. So governance is a really important part of these, these management plans because we can't figure out every single eventuality in the course of a management plan. That, that document will be a thousand pages long. A really important part of this is figuring out um, when this stuff comes up as it inevitably does uh, how we're going to deal with it, and in general, this is a this is a broad governance document. It's it's defining not every single little specific thing in most cases, although it can be very specific, but defining broad goals and objectives. The other thing I should say about about the management plan is that um, you know there there are opportunities for the management plan to be again sort of this broad governance document, and that for there to be other plans that are attached to that document that uh, define more specifically different uses. So an example of this is a forest management plan. So if you wanna do forest management um, on, on a town forest, you have to have a forest management plan, which you can develop and attach later to the management plan, which has more specific information about forest management. A similar thing could be a recreation management plan or a hunting management plan, which is just adding increased specificity to the management plan at a later date. So you don't have to get everything all at once. So I just wanna provide a couple of case studies, um, ways that other towns have addressed uh, some of these land use and management planning issues on other town forests. None of this is meant to be uh, prescriptive. It's just meant to sort of describe how other towns have addressed this because you're not the first people who have faced, you know, this challenge of creating a management plan on a town forest. So one really cool one that I deal with a lot is the Heinsberg Town Forest. Um, this is an 864 acre, uh, non-conserved town forest in the town of Hinesburg, hopefully will be formally conserved with a conservation easement very soon. It's been owned for, by the town for over 70 years. Um, in 2012, the Hinesburg Town Forest uh, did a big public outreach process to create a management plan, just like you guys are doing right now. It, it took, in their case, multiple years because they were just figuring it out on their own. Um, and what they were really trying to do was balance different land uses, right? So they had uh, really well-defined recreational trail network and recreational community. Lots of people who are using um, the town forest for hunting. And then also this history of the demonstration of responsible forest management. And one of the things they ended up doing was dividing the town forest into different zones. Um, they have a intensive use zone, which is an area around roads and in some of these historic plantations where more intensive forest management is potentially allowed higher density of trail uses is allowed, um, an intermediate use zone where lesser trail density, lesser intensity of forest management, 
and a low intensity zone, which is essentially a no management zone in which uh, I think there's one trail that goes through this area, but mostly it's untrailed and it's unmanaged. And one of the really cool things about the zone approach is number one, it allows us to provide a lot of different things on an individual property. Uh, and number two, it allows people who have different values to be represented in the, the land use of that property. So some people wanted all the recreational use, all the forest management, all the hunting everywhere. And some people wanted nothing anywhere. Um, and so on, this is an example of sort of one of these compromises that we make um, that allow us to do a, lot, a little bit of a lot of different things and help us all feel represented in the management of our public lands. Similarly, I recently developed a, a forest management plan for the Andrews Community Forest, um, which is a community forest in Richmond that the Vermont Land Trust was super, super integral, especially Bob Heiser in helping the town of Richmond acquire, conserve. Um, and we also put in three management intensity zones with different rules governing forest management, which included uh, the size of openings that we can create, the logging equipment that can be used in these different areas, um, and also applies to recreation trail density. Each of these zones is about a third of the area. Again, it's generally like intensive management, intensive trails, less intensive management, less intensive trails, and reserve. And it, with the recognition of that we want a diversity of different uses and different types of forests across our landscape, um, including areas that are basically unmanaged and are just protected as such. Um, some other interesting ideas, no forest management is allowed between April 1 and August 1 to avoid bird breeding season. That's the case on a couple of, of these other conserved town forests. And when we wanted to create new trails, we created an ecological inventory process. So when we're putting in trails, we know that we're putting them in places that are less ecologically sensitive. <laughs> Lastly, uh, I'll give you this study of what's called the Westford Town Lands. This is another Mont Land Trust project that helped the town of Westford create a community forest that is called the Maple Shade Town Forest. Um, when we went to write a forest management plan for the Maple Shade Town Forest, it turned out that uh, the town also owned this piece of land behind the school right here across the road, which they called, they, they uh, let the kids at the school pick the name. And so it ended up being called the Misty Meadows Trails and Forest. Um, and so we said, well, geez, let's do a management planning process for both that new town forest, Maple Shade, and for that, that existing piece of land, the Misty Meadows Trails and Forest. Um, and so we did. And so what happened was something really interesting. So two different pieces of land. Um, one thing I should also say is on the Misty Meadows Trails and Forest behind the school, no firearms allowed. So hunting was completely out of the question. And there was already a really well-established recreational trail network. So what we ended up doing is saying, we're gonna really focus on no hunting, recreation and education on the Misty Meadows Forest behind the school. And on the new Maple Shade Town Forest, um, we are gonna allow basically our, our main goal is just gonna be very dispersed recreation, hunting and just wildlife habitat and enhancing the function of that area uh, as a wildlife corridor. And so recreation education are the key focuses on the MMTF, the Misty Meadows Trails and Forest Behind the School, forest management, wildlife habitat, um, and just sort of letting that area be a functional piece of forest land for the world uh, is the main focus on the MSTF, the Maple Shade Town Forest. So we were able to, to balance different things and give different user groups different things uh, by not even on an individual property, but across two separate pieces of land. So lastly, and lastly, I just want to acknowledge, so this is a picture of, of your beautiful town of Forest, that, um, you know, this is a planning, management planning for a town forest is something that is challenging no matter what. Uh, there's always people in, in a given community who have different ideas about the right way to manage our resources, different ideas about the types of usage that are important to them, different ideas about the role of human humans in our forests altogether. And it's always really, really hard. And I also want to acknowledge that the specific challenge of this town forest is like extra hard. And it's really complex. And you're facing this, this really complicated mix of questions about how you manage this really unique piece of land for a variety of different things, including social, cultural importance, uh, ecological reasons. Um, in some ways, 
you know, you have less options than other town forests and with respect to the fact that you like don't have a traditional mature forest, which most of these towns start with. But in other respects, you actually have a lot more options. So you get to radically define the course of this piece of land into the future from a relatively blank slate, both as, as, a, as an ecosystem and also as a public resource. And just to leave you with this parting words that uh, if it seems at any point in this process, if you're like, whoa, this is really hard, uh, that's because it is and it's supposed to be. So that doesn't mean that anything is wrong. Um, it's just complicated and it's just going to be complicated. And um, if we approach this discourse with grace and um, and are willing to listen, we can come out with something really, really special. So that's it for me. Ethan, that was awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd be happy if any folks have questions, I'd be happy to, to try and answer them uh, in the chat. We have no questions, I think. Could it be? I guess I covered it. Well, I love I don't hearing. see any questions, but I really do appreciate Ethan's um, sentiment that this is really hard. And, and all of you who are part of this conversation now, because we've all invited mm -hmm. you in at this moment, are kind of launching into this. And those of us on the steering committee have been engaging in this really difficult conversation for several months and we think it's hard and we really want your help. So um, I'm really looking forward to your input in the coming session with Peter Forbes. Super. So we are done screen sharing and we get to look at each other now. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and um, this is, uh, we're really happy that uh, uh, Peter Forbes uh, has made himself available to facilitate this process. Um, I think you're gonna enjoy it. Let me just tell you briefly about Peter. He and his partner, Helen, you may know have run Knoll Farm for 20 years where they provide organic food and a community gathering spot for the Valley. They're also both members of the Mad River Valley Ambulance Squad and um, hope you don't have to see him in that capacity, <laughs> but we're really happy to see you. In, you shouldn't in have said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. And thanks, Pete and Ethan. That was that was great. It was really, really helpful. Um, yeah, you know, I, I live at Knoll Farm and so which is a protected farm, which is one of the valley's protected farms. So if you've been here to pick berries, go for a hike picnicking, that's because of conservation. Um, and that's really what we're all talking about tonight as well. Um, we're not seeking resolution, answers. Really, we're here to listen to each other and, and to learn some things. And because this is such an important topic, um, I really want us to join it uh, as our best selves. You know, and, and I have some thoughts for you about how to, to join this uh, with our best selves. Um, and I'll pop these into the chat in a moment, but I, I, I ask all of us to assume goodwill from everyone else. Everyone's really trying to figure this out. Everyone cares a lot. Um, we ask you to share what you believe, um, but not necessarily what anyone else believes. Don't, don't, uh, waste any your time or our time reporting on what you think others feel. Just share where you're, you're at. Um, be open to having your opinions changed. If we're really listening to each other right, we're, we're, we should be learning new things. Um, that's the point of this. And finally, uh, two minutes tops. We want you to speak often, uh, but succinctly. And I'm gonna hop in and remind you um, if you've gone beyond two minutes. In short, please share what uh, you care about in a respectful way that leaves lots of space for other voices. And that's what every democracy needs right now. So we've asked three people um, to begin by sharing their very, very different uh, shades of love of Boyce Hill in order to surface at the very start of this uh, what the steering committee believes might be the full range of opinions about how to how to care for that that beautiful land. 
So I'm going to give these three, um, three minutes each to do kind of a this I believe and to ask them to set the tone for us. We've asked three Faston residents because while Boyce Hill is a valley-wide resource, it's the townspeople of Faston who are gonna end up paying for its costs. And we do wanna hear from everyone in the valley and beyond, uh, but we're gonna start with these, this I believe, from Tom Bisbee, from Wendy Bridgewater and Akil Kaplan, very respected members of our uh, community. And what I've asked them to speak to in three minutes is, this is what I love about Boys Hill. This is what I think is unique about it. This is what I hope it could be. And this is what I ask of my fellow townspeople. Tom, you're on my friend. I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? We can, you did a great job. All right, good. Nice to um, see you people the ones I can see. Um, greetings to all of you from out, out there in Zoom land. I love what Peter just said about shades of love. That was very nice. Um, I'm not sure I'm following the specifications exactly, but I have three pages and the wide space, so I don't think I'll go too long. Um, so here goes. Um, I've known the Risley Pasture, AKA Boyce Hill Town Forest, for many, many years. Though I'm sure that some of you, Woody Duggan comes to mind, have been there more times in a year than I have in my lifetime. On the other hand, my unique value to this Zoom might be to give a historical and most personal perspective. Here goes. When my parents bought their place at the top of Fisher Hill, now called Dunbar Hill in 1923, there was a big field to the west between their place and Burnt Rock Mountain. It was owned at that time by Aura and Clara Risley. I don't know when Aura and Clara bought it or when they sold it, but our family has always called that beautiful field the Risley Pasture. I do know this is 1923. It has been owned by, among others, Paul Hartshorn. I know that because I tried to buy it from him, but he wanted $1,600, which is way too much money in the 60s. Um, and um, Bob Newis. I don't know if Pearly Boyce, if he is a Boyce of Boyce Hill, ever owned it. I'm mystified by the Boyce name here because I didn't know Pearly Boyce. Um, so for an old fuddy duddy like me, it is strange to hear the Risley pasture referred to as the Boyce Hill Forest. Because A, I don't think of that beautiful pasture as woods. And B, I'm not sure what Pearly Boyce had to do with it. Pearly Boyce was a fine and good man with whom I went to the Tunbridge Fair with in 1948. I was born in Concord, Mass in 1933, but every summer of my life since then has been here in North Faston, from 33 to 63 at the end of Bisbee Road, and from 63 um, to now at the end of Dunbar Hill Road. Also, we were here in the winters from 2001 to 2018. One of the high points during all those years were our walks and skis to the Risley pasture. In the early days, probably the 1940s, I think I remember cows there, hence the pasture. But by the 60s, certainly the cattle had departed and the fields were slowly turning into woods. So I've always been thankful to Bob Newis for clearing the trees, even though it was a little rough, but it was, it was necessary in order to keep the view. Um, the end point of our walk was a knoll near the pasture's top. Aside from the top of Burnt Rock, it was about the only place in North Faison with a view. Standing or sitting at the knoll, we had a 180 degree vista, looking left at Old Strag, then down at Pearly Boyce's farm, later Farnsworth, and finally to the right at Burnt Rock. Vermont's lush forest, make panoramic, panoramic views hard to come by. So the Risley pastures view was very rare. I'm not particularly happy about the use of forest or voice, but I hope I'm clear. No matter what you all do with this wonderful gift of land, please save the view. That's it. Thank you, Tom. Well done, well done. Uh, can we hear from Wendy Bridgewater? This I believe. Wendy, you're on. Unmute yourself. Okay, and I, I, I'm unmuted. Did that work? 
You, it most certainly did. All right. So when we bought our land on Boyce Road 34 years ago from Ward Lumber Company, the road above us was at best a four-wheeler track. We became fast friends with Bob Newis and had his permission to use his land. We have hiked, skied, used the pond, and spent time on every inch of this property. It has been one of the most amazing gifts of life here. We know this land intimately in all seasons and weathers. Bob started an excavating business, resurfaced all the roads, built the pond, sold some of the gravel and topsoil to his customers. After construction, the soil mostly healed itself due to the annual mowings being left on the ground. The wildflowers grew more diverse, milkweed, goldenrods, and other native species spread. This brought in birds, including kestrels, flickers, pollinators, butterflies, fireflies, and lots of other wildlife. This special place has been our backyard and we have loved the incredible deep, expansive, open views, not just of the mountains, but within the meadow itself that allowed for viewing wildlife without disturbing them. This has included watching moose swim across the pond, deer, mama bears with cubs in the apple trees to mention a few. We have valued the fact that in winter, the whole property was a safe place to ski, especially in early and late season and low snow when the rest of the backcountry did not have enough snow depth for safe skiing. We love the old farm field atmosphere with the views on the entire walk, not just at viewpoints. We had always wanted one of these old farms for our own, but did not, could not find one we could afford. By far the hardest thing has been to watch so much of what we have loved about the land start to disappear due to the lack of annual mowing while the land transfer happened. In our opinion, there is no place like this in the valley or nearby. There are plenty of woods to enjoy, but nothing like this meadow is publicly available. We hope it continues to be open only from dawn to dusk with trails added around the pond, around most of the perimeter. We would like to always be allowed to use the vital connecting trail over to the state land in Dowsville, which is currently through private land. We would ask our fellow users of this land to please drive more slowly on Boyce Road. We hope the no fires rule would be respected and I would ask dog lovers to be more respectful of non-dog lovers. Also, please understand that most of the trails coming onto this property are private landowner only access trails and prior permission should be sought before using any trails out of this field. So, thank you. So, that was really great, Wendy. Thank you so much. Can, um, can we hear, hear from Akil? Yes, I hope you can. Do you hear me? We can. Thank you. Akira. Wonderful. You're on. All right. Well, thanks uh, for the both both people who spoke before me. That was fantastic, and I hope to uh, offer something a little bit different right now. Um, like everyone, I've been going up there for years and enjoyed every little piece of that field and uh, pond has to offer. Um, without question, it is one of the more unique properties with one of the best views in the valley. That pond is like nothing else uh, we have around. Um, I'm going to just share a quick story, actually, to, to save my piece. Laying with my kids up there um, earlier, we were talking about, hey, now that the town of Faison has this, what are we going to do with this? And one of my children had the uh, whereabouts to say, well, why don't we ask the land what it wants us to do with it? And I thought, wow, what a great idea. So we stood there and laid on the ground and talked to this land for quite a while about what it wanted and got some interesting answers that I don't know if many of us have thought about. And I think what my hope is for the community going forward is that we stop and really consider what the land really wants. And at what point can we recreate and be responsible at the same time? And at what point can we wear the hats of a conservationist and we can wear the hats of a recreational user? And um, I think that's what I would love to see for Boyce would be for it to become a hub in this community for education about proper land management, proper land ownership, 
um, proper um, thinking about future generations and perhaps what uh, it will look like for them, uh, what bringing back native species would do, what bringing back native shrublands would do to that, what restoring uh, better soils would do for water runoff and the pond quality. Um, and I just think a lot about how we can do both and maybe recreate on this land, but also have it be a more profound impact about us as people and as stewards going forward in a place where we love to enjoy recreation, but we're running out of places to recreate. And uh, at some point we're gonna have to decide when is too much. And I think voice could become an opportunity for us to show that as a, as a really balanced approach um, going forward. Thank you so much, Akil. That was great. All three of you make me so proud to be a part of this community. So we want to hear others, shades of love for Boyce Hill. Um, and the way to do that is use your raise your hand feature um, and it will bring it to my attention and I'll call on you. And again, the only thing I ask of you are those things in the chat there. So who would like to um, speak next? I'm a man very comfortable with silence. <laughs> Are you just figuring out how to use the uh, tools or? All right, Danielle, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This was very informative and I so appreciated hearing the different um, presentations. I'm especially excited about the idea of variable use. Um, I've loved going up there and enjoying the pond and the trails. And um, as a horse owner, I've spoken with this group before about the value of being able to use the egress from the roadway that's already in place there to still cross the property and access the trails that go up into the state land. So I'm hoping that this is still um, the idea of multi-use for this area is still very much considered as you guys go forward. And I'm so appreciative of being able to participate in this listening session and, and continuing to advocate for the broad use of the land. And I appreciate that that is in consideration right now. So thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Mary, would you like to share your thoughts? Yes, although I actually have a question. Is, can we do that? Or do you just want to hear how I feel about the forest? Yeah, happy to answer uh, uh, questions, although we probably don't have the answers. Um, you know, this <laughs> okay. Is, this is just a uh, listening session. The management plan mm -hmm. has not been written yet. Well, I do. I support all that's been said for multi-use. I also agree with keeping the views open and the meadows. I think those are very valuable parts of the property. As a not exactly a joiner, but a nearby a joiner, um, I also support being careful of the private trails because some of those trails come right down to my property. And right now I hide them so that I don't have a lot of people, you know, I like scrape and put wood in front of mine. So you can't necessarily see how to get onto my property. Uh, my question was other than to avoid um, kind of impacts to adjoiners, what's the reason for the dawn to dusk limitations? if you can answer that. Pete, I'm gonna to turn to you for just a second. Is, it, is that something that the steering committee can answer? Do you know enough now? I can hand it off to Corey or Lisa. So okay, it's, it's, part, it's part of the interim management plan, okay. um, which was just a placeholder mm -hmm. um, while we go through this process that we're going through now. I, um, Corey. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily objecting to it. I just wondered, you know, if there was a scientific reason or a legal reason or any other reason other than it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Let's hear from Corey or Lisa on it. Um, I'm happy to just add that um, Lisa and I, in our service on the Conservation Commission um, and decisions with the select board early on when we had to make these decisions about the interim management plan, wanted to be... Um, as thoughtful as possible and, and sort of leave open openings later, but not let too many things happen right from the, the beginning. Um, so it was really just 
this ethic that we approach the whole thing with like to be a little bit more restrictive in the beginning and see how we could open things up. Um, and it wasn't specifically thought about any more than that general approach to the whole interim management plan. And Lisa, if you wanna to add to that, please do. And uh, thank you for those answers. And I was only um, asking because of moonlight hikes that I've been up there before. Right. Which are lovely. Right. Yep, yep. Well, that's exactly what we need to hear and want to hear more about, Mary. So Wendy, you would like to uh, speak again, please. So my reasoning for that, and I think that it was expressed by a lot of the adjacent landowners uh, before, to go back in history, when uh, there was a gate that used to be at the end of Marie Sailor's driveway, that Mike Quinville asked the town, I mean, asked Bob Newis to move further up into the property, which is where the gate is now. But for a while, the gate wasn't there. And the partying that went on and the people driving up this hill and then driving down at 60 miles an hour when it was a rough road was unbelievable. The fires that were going on, all kinds of things that happened up there. So for some of us who have lived on the road and live around it, this dawn to dust thing has been, has been really important to us because while we used to be at the end of the dirt road and have quiet, now we, especially last summer, after the road was constructed to class three, the traffic has been unbelievable. The speed that people are driving is unbelievable. And at least at dusk, it stops. And we have quiet. And we have back the place that we bought and love and if it was allowed to have camping and it was allowed to have people up there, at special permits to go do stuff, neighbors wandering on in the dark, uh, you know, who's to say? But to have it officially open would be for us really, really detrimental. Okay. So now we're, we're beginning to get a sense of how these different shades of love <laughs> interact with each other. Um, let's hear from others about uh, what you would like to see happen at Boyce Hill. Please. Yeah, on mute. Oh, hello. Uh, you're, you're good to go. <laughs> good. Uh, well, first, thank you, steering committee uh, and volunteers for putting this together. I know you've been putting a lot of hours in and I'm sure it's not easy. So thank you. Uh, second, uh, I've been in this town with my husband a year and a half. And you know, I just wonder what nature and wildlife want there. You know, I think they would like some trees. I think they love the meadows. That's what they would like. And more native species is more food for them. You know, of course, you know, it's good to have a couple views. I wouldn't kill all the views, but to say that there should be 360 views, I don't know. Uh, last is as far as, you know, it'd be good if you could get a permit to go there for maybe stargazing or groups at night, or maybe the scouts one night here or there, because night is a special time here in Vermont. And that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Martha. Um, I think Joe and Ray would like to speak. Uh, just unmute yourself, Joan, and, and join us. Thank you for that, Martha. Um, Joan, are you interested? It's actually, it's actually Paul Sippel. I'm, I'm oh, hi, Paul. Paul. Sorry about that. That's <laughs> OK. No, it's all right. Um, I was at the office, and, and it was longer than I was expecting it to be, and uh, so I, I ran home. Um, so I, I have, um, uh, so my point of love, I, I would sort of like to represent, uh, well, or try to represent maybe, or talk about anyway, 
the constituency that isn't represented here, and that is the the flora and the fauna uh, that and the microbiome that that exists on that property. Um, my assumptions here are that this started out way back when a forest, and then it was um, cut down when the, most of Vermont was cut down, and, and then it was a farm. Then it started to be a forest again. And then it was opened again, uh, stopped being a forest again uh, for development. Uh, and now it's open for a whole variety of things uh, under a potential management plan. Um, all of these iterations are due to human intervention. And, um, and here we have an opportunity, and I think a golden and unique opportunity to let nature take the lead on management, quote unquote, of this land. Um, one of the things that, it, uh, when people speak of the views, uh, there is a cost to those views. It is cut down with probably one of the most polluting types of equipment that you can use, which is a four, four, you know, four stroke uh, engine, uh, brush hog kind of a of operation, which is if, if we are concerned about global warming uh, and uh, how is that the use of those things to keep a view, um, how does that make us as global citizens? Um, and we must consider the effects of that view on the flora and the fauna that could live there. And um, and, and I think probably what makes this the most difficult is how you we can make this place be all of the above and none of the above. And that is by letting nature take its role and that we use our, and that we fit into nature, not through management, not through building trails, not for defining what gets cut and not gets cut, but by observing what nature does over time, whether there's invasive species there or not. How do we, uh, we watch nature handle it. And, um, and I think that over time, letting nature take over uh, as the prime manager of that land, uh, we will be left with a much more contemplative place than will exist under human management. Um, and I think human management is something that uh, tends to be a slippery slope into more and more and more. And, oh, we haven't visited that place in a while. Um, from the management standpoint, let's see what we can do up there now, and, as opposed to Nate, as opposed to ourselves going up there and saying, oh, look, look at how this has changed. I also think that one of the other key oh, factors- you've spoken for a little bit more than two, just so you okay. know. Sorry, all right. So, That's all right, wrap it up. Okay, uh, so I also think that it's a great place for the school, for our children in the town and, and adults actually, to um, do a biological inventory over time. And there's nothing better for the, than the school to do it because the kids can start out in kindergarten going up there and, and with proper guidance, uh, you know, grid the place out and measure what's growing here now. What, and, and, and with a little bit more depth as they get older, finding out what biological activity there is in the soil and how that changes over a 20 year period. And, and then parents will come back and their kids will go up there and compare inventories um, at, at, uh, over time. So uh, I think that, I, I think what, what makes it difficult is the, is it for us to take a breath and say, we don't need to touch this. Let's let nature show us what it can do. Thank you, Paul. And if you have more to say, um, join in later. We just want to bring in as many voices as okay. we can as we'd like to speak. 
So thank you very much. Who else would like to speak? Brad, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, let me get my hand down here. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you to everybody who's been a part of this. Um, I, I really appreciate an opportunity as a citizen uh, of, of Waitsfield uh, to be able to be part of this conversation and to have had access to this land. Um, I, um, I, some folks know that I'm, I'm interested in the cultural history of the land and of the area in particular. Um, and I believe that uh, this land offers us a, a bit of a sliver, a glimpse into um, a, a piece of our cultural history that um, has been grown in or, or, or used as private property. Um, this, is a, this is an old hill farm. Um, it has a history. Um, and uh, there is some, there's some evidence up there that is, uh, is still visible and it tells a story about the land use. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I appreciate that part of the land and I, I'd like to see that part of the land preserved. And I'd like to have a opportunity to, to have the public educated on the land use uh, and, and not only the, the, the kind of interesting aspects of it, but also the, the damaging aspects of it. Um, you know, the, that kind of farming that was done um, wasn't necessarily healthy for the land and, and, it, and it damaged the land in it, to an extent. And I think that there's an opportunity here to show what the land looks like um, in di different stages of recovery. Um, and, I, and I think that might be a really fascinating way to, uh, to use a piece of land like this is to allow for some of it to um, talk to its past and to show its past and to show our history as a, as a state uh, and as a region of our country and also to um, show what it looks like to move on from a piece of land like this, to actually be able to have a, a, a view into what a land, piece of land looks like to regenerate, um, to, to go back to, um, to, a, to a, a natural forest. So I would love to see a place where we could have um, a, a little bit of both, um, a, a place where we could see some of the land regenerating and be able to study it and observe it and uh, utilize it for that, but also a place where we can have our, a, a little glimpse of our past. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brad. That's that's great. This is wonderful. Um, let's hear more. This is so valuable. All of these voices have been really, really helpful. Who would um, like to express their hopes for Voice Hill? Patricia, Pat. Uh, hi. Yeah, um, good to see you. <laughs> good to see, be here. I would like to say that I went up to Boys Hill for the first time with Lisa last spring and we did a bird walk and it was wonderful up there. And um, Mad Birders is uh, looking forward to doing more birding up there. It's a fabulous place and mm -hmm. birds need trees and shrubs and natural stuff to um, um, to enjoy, to raise their families and live there. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. John, is, are you raising your hand? <laughs> uh, unmute yourself, my friend, and join us. You're still muted. Here we go. Ah, perfect. Uh I think listening to the various people, it, it brings to mind that bird watching a variety of birds, some in trees, some need the fields. So keeping fields open, not only for skiers and for views, um, also protect some of the birds who nest in fields. And I agree with uh, one of the comments that Letting some of it go to nature is a wonderful thing. So I'm not proposing that um, it all be clear cut, but that uh, this is an opportunity to have the variety. I noticed that um, there are some uh, state lands that um, the forests have been cut down to allow birds that nest in fields specifically um, have been uh, a, a priority of the state. Um, 
and also for the apple trees who allow for food for the deer. So I, I think it's just an opportunity for, for both sense. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, John. That's really helpful to hear. And I can't always, if you're on the next screen, I can't see you if you're just waving. Um, it, it, but if you hit the uh, raising the hand sign, you immediately go to <laughs> the scene, the screen that I can see. And Lisa, if you if you're watching the other screen, maybe that would help too. Yeah, Peter, uh, Janet Bisbee would like to say something. Fantastic, Janet. Hi, I can't find the uh, raise the hand thing, even though I know we were supposed to look it up at the beginning of the session. All right. All I don't right. pay attention, you know, when I'm supposed to. Um, so uh, just my, my early memories of the Risley pasture, which we used to think was the grizzly pasture because we were little kids and we were scared of bears, um, was absolutely just memorable and magical. And I'll never remember, I'll never forget the feeling of coming out, we would come up from the top and look out over, over that view. And then uh, for years I lived somewhere else and I moved back to the valley not too long ago and um, was just delighted when this um, gift was made, just in awe. And then now I approach it from the bottom and um, I don't drive fast, Wendy, I drive very slowly. And um, it's, to me, it, 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 it feels like a, um, a Olmstead property, like a Frederick Olmstead um, property. It's just perfect. It's, um, it's just gorgeous. And I just have this vision of families and um, individuals just kind of like, almost like Central Park. You know, it's, it's that special. Um, so, um, not really able to articulate it any, anymore. I just, I just think it's a, a real gem. And to me, that definitely um, uh, assumes keeping things open and letting things uh, develop. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. You know, you've done a good job with it. Thank you. Who else would like to express themselves on the future of Boyce Hill. And I think too, if, you, um, if you'd like to speak again, let's uh, rejoin, please. Share what is on your mind. Looks we just like wanna Shane. make as much space as we can for everyone. Shane might, Shane okay, might great. say something. Shane? Yeah, hi. Um, so I guess, uh, may a little bit of a different perspective here. Um, I guess to say is the Valley as a whole has seen a dramatic increase in use of its recreational facilities, especially over the past year. Um, many adverse impacts had been noted. I mean, if anybody needs to have an example, go on to Front Porch Forum, do a, do a search for dog poop, and I'm sure you'll find many, many examples. Um, you know, trails erode, uh, cars stack up on the roadsides impacting road safety. Um, so I guess all that to say, you know, whatever decisions are made as to what the ultimate uses are for the property, I hope everybody, as we move forward, um, kind of keep in mind and develop the view uh, that has a realistic view of what the impacts human use will have on the property, and that they recognize that the, the carrying capacity of the land and the utilities that serve the property. Shane, thank you for that. And I know Akil wants in, um, but let me just note that Shane has helped us to kind of go into a, another phase of this, which is the really honest piece about talking about what our fears are. And I think that's really fair game as well. Um, so I don't know if that's where you were gonna go, Akil, but share whatever you would like to share with us. And also we're approaching 8.30, just so everyone knows. Um, I feel like there's many people more who would like to talk. So if it's all right with the organizers, I'd like us to keep going and knowing that a few of you may decide to spin off. Have a wonderful evening. But for those of you who would like to talk, we, we definitely want to hear from you. So Akil, you're up. You're, you're still muted, my friend. There we go. Okay. 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, echo what Shane said. I think that's a very important thing is is what human impact looks like, the amount of cars. And uh, as we saw when they closed the bridge in Moortown, what happened to Pony Farm Road in a very short period of time? Um, you know, we had to redirect traffic for about a year and it destroyed that road. And so how what North Baston Road becomes and what becomes of Boyce Road and what how that impacts the taxpayers. There's a lot of things to think about. But I think, Peter, what you were saying is where I was going, which was fear. And, and, and my biggest fear is, is 100 years from now or 200 years from now, we won't be able to share the same stories that Tom shared at the beginning about once enjoying this pasture recently. You know, it might be 50 years ago we were able to because the pasture itself wasn't able to sustain itself. And that's something I think as a community we need to ask ourselves is how do we sustain all of this activity? How do we sustain all this recreation you know, it, it, it's, it's impossible in some ways. And I think the fear is that we are so heavily into recreation that we forget that there's a major impact of that recreation. Mountain bikes going through woods, um, you know, it, it segregates animal populations and that creates an impact. And, you know, as, as most of us know with ecology and water, you know, one little drop becomes something out in Lake Champlain later and all the things that it picked up along the way. And that happens on land. The soils up at Boyce are, are horrible right now and they are eroding quickly. And while we love that open meadow, those winds are just taking a lot of those soils that are very fragile right now with it. And so if we don't do something about managing this properly, we won't be having these conversations again. And that's, that's my biggest fear going forward is that we won't be able to enjoy this in a way or any of our properties, even as homeowners, the same things are happening on our lands, on our properties, on the Knoll Farm, on my future property. And uh, we have to be conscientious about what nature, what the, uh, the karmic, you know, response to all of this um, activity and development is. Thank you, Akil. So Marie and Janet, would you like to speak for one of you or both of you? Uh, unmute, oh, okay. So, I just want to put a word in for equity and you know the there's a real privilege to have that view and one wonderful thing about this property being like open to the public all winter long is that the littlest kids have been able to get up there and really mm. you know ski down the hill or sled or look out over that view and as an abutter, I know what happens to the land that's just left as it is because that's our land, it's unmanaged. And it's very difficult to get in there. And if you put a trail in that immediately becomes, you know, a rivulet, you know, there's really, and it's intimidating because you don't know if you're gonna run into a bear. And so one of the thoughts is that having access to nature, having access to view, having access to our natural history, that's how we build that love of nature that then sustains sustaining nature. So they, we do need to, to really think about those little kids and how they relate to the land. And I agree that we need to protect the soils and we need to do that, but it's incredibly important to have a place where families can come without worrying about buying a lift ticket and just be able to look out over these wonderful hills. Thank you so much. I see you there, Wendy, Is um, and I will come to you. I just want to make sure if there's anyone else who wants in who hasn't yet had the chance to speak, um, I want to make sure that we hear from you. Wendy, you have the floor for two minutes. I would add, because of all the time living here and watching it through Irene, watching it through storms that took out both uh, Dunbar Hill and Sharpshooter Road and damaged the road up here before, between us and the field before it was restored, uh, absolutely nothing was evident up there of any erosion, of any runoff, of any problem whatsoever. 
Mm. with the traffic that was there at the time, with the mowing that was there at the time, nothing happened up there. It did happen on these roads. So I, I am all for keeping the water clean, but the water is clean. The water started to get dirty this summer because of all of the people in the pond and the dogs in the pond. And, you know, who knows where they were going to the bathroom and all of that stuff. But um, I, I just want to speak that, you know, what I've watched is we had wildflowers, we had all these things, and they have started to disappear because of the saplings that have been allowed to grow due to the whole way everything happened during the land transfer. I'm not, you know, blaming anybody for that. It's just saying that I've witnessed the habitat disappear that is unique in this area of huge amounts of forest all around it. So yes, we have to worry about the wildlife, but I think we'll be um, doing a great harm to what's gone on for hundreds of years and the habits that the animals have gained because they've had some of this open land to graze in and do whatever. Anyway, that's anyway. That's great, Wendy, thank you, appreciate that. So Matt and Danielle would like in. Matt, you haven't spoken yet, so please go first. That's all right. One more click to, yeah, there you go. There you go. It took me a long time to find the raise hand button too, so it's uh, <laughs> Um, so I just, I'm a resident of, of Waitsfield and <clears throat> I've known this property for many years. Um, one of the nice things I can say about the sort of recent transaction or the sale of the property to Faiston and the subsequent creation of the parking lot is I no longer feel like I'm sneaking up there. Like it always felt like sort of a secret spot to go to. And now that there's a parking lot, you sort of feel like, okay, it's a little bit more welcoming to go up there. Um, a couple of things that uh, just experiences I've had in the last year up there. Um, I've taken my son there a number of times and he's extraordinarily fascinated by that foundation. Um, every time we go, he's like, can we go in the foundation? And, you know, there's prickers, there's um, the stones a little loose, but as a curiosity for kids, it's such a fascinating feature. Um, I know one of the other speakers mentioned the history of the property um, not just the mention of it as the Risley property, but just the overall history. And what I wonder is if you could connect in some way, some sort of interpretive signage or something that tells the story of the property from the perspective of this foundation is the foundation of the Risley house, you know, it's just a really neat way to capture people's imagination. Um, and then back in the, the sort of dead of winter, I went to a, a tree pruning up on the a property as well to sort of learn about how to prune apple trees and I thought what an amazing resource for the town that there are these old apple trees on this property and that with uh, a little bit of love and care they could probably produce apples again not only for wildlife but for like to see you wanted to walk by and grab an apple while you're up there it's kind of an interesting way of engaging with the property um, I think similarly um, with the idea of managing versus not managing um, one of the most wonderful aspects of being up there is the view when you get to the top of that hill and you're looking back in any direction, it's breathtaking. And the way the light plays and the you're seeing off to the ski hills, but also out to Burnt Rock. And uh, it's just a dramatic landscape. Um, I, I, I tend to be on the side. I think it needs management. I think there is probably a really smart way to manage it where you can have some areas grow in this forest and some areas remain open. Um, I also like to ski on that property. It's an amazing spot to go early season and late season. And I always drive slowly when I drive up there. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a really, it's an amazing piece of land. And I think there are ways to do it with, you know, just, just for instance, at the tree pruning, there were probably 25 people that showed up and they paid money to do it. And I think you could get people to go up there with sides similar to like what they do at Mad River and go trim that land so you don't need a mower. So there's a lot of creative ways to manage this. Um, I see it as just an incredible community resource and uh, I appreciate you guys allowing me to talk. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Danielle, you're up. Thank you. I gotta figure out to put my hand down again. There we go. Um, thank you so much. You uh, 
mentioned being able to to invite any fears that we might have. I love the information that's been shared. So many great perspectives. Um, engaging young people is huge, and the variety of of ideas. Um, keeping it open is fabulous. There is a, a ton of surrounding wood there, and I think I see lots of evidence of animals using that property. But I think a fear that I have is that. Um, the way we recreate and how people's biases might influence what's allowed to happen there versus um, relying on the science. And so I'm really hopeful that the science can um, rule the day a little bit there to inform us best on one, how to care for the land, which I'm hearing a lot of people speak to, but also how to enjoy it um, across the different activities that we all love to do. And again, being a horse owner, I'm in the minority, but I think that there's real value in being able to use an existing road to access forest trails. And um, I really hope that we can continue to look at impacts and rely on the science and not necessarily just go on biases. So that's, that's my fear and I'll just name that. I appreciate that opportunity. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Danielle. This has been really powerful, a lot coming forth. Um, and if there is more to be said that, that hasn't been said, I think we want to hear it. Um, it's also almost quarter of nine, and probably all of us have had full days. We don't necessarily want to uh, have it go on just to repeat. So if your heart is pounding um, and you want to say something that, that you feel hasn't been said, uh, we really do want to hear it. Lisa, are you seeing anything on the other page that I can't see? Well, I'm gonna, um, okay. Paul, thank you. Rejoin us, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to comment. I think uh, we just, although that view is pretty spectacular, I think we need to realize that keeping that view has an environmental cost. And I think the other piece that we're sort of not we don't seem to be looking at is that um, this area is widely forested because nature, I think, is telling us that that is what does best here and what is best for this area. If this were to be naturally uh, open land, it, it would be that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it is not naturally open land. It is naturally forested land. And I think that the more we try to work against nature by keeping it open, the more we are contributing to our carbon footprint uh, uh, relative to the world and, and that other people suffer for our wants of uh, a lovely view. Uh, granted, it's lovely and it'll be lovely for many, many years. But I think if we let nature decide uh, what our view should be, we'll be better off in the long run. Mm -hmm. I think someone uh, beyond Wendy there would like to speak. Thank you for that, Paul. I, I, now I, I forgot what I was going to say, but um, this land has been open for a long time. Um, yes, it's not naturally open, nor are the fields for our farmers down, you know. Um, it's a unique piece of property. I think we all are concerned about, you know, if everything's woods and that's what we all do, well, they're gonna have to be cut down. They're mature. We're gonna use dinosaurs to cut them down. As far as I know, we don't have solar equipment yet to cut these things down for hundreds of years. This piece of land has been open. All of this land was open a hundred years ago. This land has been kept open 
the woods grew up around it. And if we don't have 65,000 acres of woods around this little 93 acre piece of land, I don't know what I'm looking at. So it, it, the uniqueness of this is the fact that so many man hours, there's stone walls around us for a reason. We don't just put them up in the middle of woods. So I, for one, would like to see it managed properly, but I don't believe uh, by letting it go to saplings and losing any kind of recreation, losing any kind of use for it for 80 years to grow up trees to forest. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, for the 20 gallons of diesel fuel a year, maybe one cutting one day, day and a half, I don't know. You know, it, it's a pretty small, I think, um, impact on this particular piece of land to kind of just say, let's just let it grow up. Why was it given to us? The reason it was given to us was so that everyone could enjoy the beautiful value that that land has the way it is, not the way it is. Who's going to drive up to the end of the road to go walk in the woods when you can do it anywhere? Okay, that's what I have to say. Thank you for saying it. Thank you for saying it. Um, so Darlene would like in, and we would like to hear you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can. All right. I am very thankful for Ben saying what he just said because um, frankly, there's so much to say. And I wrote something, you know, to read tonight and just speaking to this group on this topic is making my heart pound. So Woody's rubbing my back right now. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's been so much said tonight. I, I'm thankful that Janet spoke about the kids sledding. Um, there was a ton of people up there this year, it, it, you know, because they know it's a new property that's available, a recreational property. We do have a lot of choices to make. I am all for keeping the views. The whole top of the property has suffered in the last six to eight years because the top part wasn't mowed. Um, much of the middle and lower part had remained mowed until, you know, a few of the recent years. I can remember seeing Woody laying in the field at the top. I call it the tundra, picking pinky sized strawberries and made seven jars of jam with it. This year, the top of the field was a mess of blackberries and tall grass. I worry about walking through that and getting ticks. Um, the Adirondack chairs location has been primarily you know, the view, the place that people go to get a view. But even early this season before the mowing, I was reluctant to walk down what has been an established path because it was all tall grass. Um, and I, you know, there's so much more to say, but the other thing I'll comment on is it's interesting. We do all have diverse input to contribute. Somebody just recently said the parking lot was inviting. Um, I was shocked to see all the time or prior to all the time the town, townspeople, volunteers and steering committee has spent analyzing this parcel. I was shocked to see that the town just turned the road into this wide boulevard without even noticing that that might happen. Uh, shame on me if I didn't see it in any of the notifications. But, you know, I much prefer the lumpy, bumpy dirt road that we used to have going up to that property. I think maybe I've said enough. <laughs> Thank you, Darlene. <laughs> you know, 
the one thing I want to say to everyone is that this is not the end of a conversation. You know, this is the beginning of a conversation, right? And I, I really, I have great respect, Darlene, for anyone whose heart is pounding over a piece of land. I think that's a really good thing. Um, but we don't have to, you know, we don't have to say it all this evening. In fact, there's what, three more of these? <laughs> is that right? <laughs> so there's, our community is taking this really seriously and there'll be lots and lots of opportunity to, to express uh, the full range of opinions. Um, is there uh, another voice that needs to be heard this, this particular evening? And I'm, the only reason I'm, I'm kind of calling it a bit is that we are almost a half hour beyond our, our stated uh, closing time. So I, I wanna be respectful of everyone. Uh, Pete Colgan has, wants to say something. So maybe it's a wrap up uh, type comment I'd like to make. Uh, I'm making it as a as citizen, uh, as much as I am a member of the steering committee. And it comes out of kind of this bumpy experience I've been a part of, sponsored by the Friends of the Mad River Valley, and they created this uh, educational opportunity for us um, offered by a group called Regenesis that's designed to change how we think, <laughs> pretty much. And uh, one, one of the takeaways from that is that we see uh, potential conflict here, right? Um, Paul wants to let it go um, completely natural and other people, um, no one's really said it clearly, but clearly it's should we mow it or should we not? And it's really easy to think of these things as um, black and white, either or. And there is another way to think about these things that um, uh, I think I personally on the steering committee, but I think all of us um, have drunk this Kool-Aid that there's a huge opportunity here um, to see, to create something maybe better than um, anybody thought was possible. Um, and it's not through compromise. It's through leveraging. Um, it, it's, it's taking advantage uh, of what is in a way that can create something that maybe we haven't even thought about. Um, so the, the, commit, the, uh, the next sessions that we're doing, uh, the next session that we're doing is on natural resources. Um, we're going to focus pretty much exclusively on that. And then after that, we're gonna focus pretty much exclusively on recreation. And then at the end, I, we don't know what's gonna happen, but, but it's gonna, uh, maybe, maybe it'll be educational, cultural, maybe it'll be a wrap up. But um, the, the way I'm thinking about it is that there is something miraculous here that um, it's our responsibility to uncover. And so these ideas, everything that's come up today, um, I don't see them, at, I am trying hard not to see them as being uh, conflicting ideas, but inputs into um, something that, that we can create that'll be just as magical as it is now for the next century. <laughs> that's it. Well said, Pete. Um, the only thing I wanna add is I am so grateful to live in this valley with each of you and with folks who care so much about the land. It's a really, really important thing. So thank you to the organizers. Thank you to all of you who showed up and spoke. Um, it's really great, great to be with you and, and great to be on this journey uh, to figure this one out together. Have a great night, folks. <laughs>